This is Treks to Nowhere. All right, so in this episode, I'm gonna talk about something that's oft debated amongst geographiles, geographers, and, well, politicians, and that's borders, more specifically, political borders. If you think about it, borders are one of those weird things that we all recognize exist, but yet when you stop and you really think about it, they kind of don't really exist, in a sense. At the most fundamental level, borders are just imaginary lines that we draw on maps separating one piece of land from another. And sure, sometimes we cut literal swaths and trees to mark that boundary, but really when you think about it, the boundary itself is just a goofy human concept. Now you might be thinking, what about political borders that are separated by a physical delineation, let's say a river? So for example, let's take the border between Mississippi and Louisiana, which is marked by the Mississippi River. Here's the thing about the Mississippi River though, and really any river, is that it changes. Water is powerful, it moves, it erodes banks, you get meander bends in the river, you get places where the river will actually pinch off and form what's called an oxbow lake, and all of this happens over time. So if you've drawn the border on the river, a hundred years later, what happens to that border after the river has changed where it lies? Well, it depends on the situation. For the Mississippi River, the border doesn't change. And so what ends up happening is you get places where the river meanders around and pinches off a piece of land, which now falls on the wrong side of the river. So we have a tiny sliver of, say, Louisiana that falls on the east side of the Mississippi River. So you can get these strange little points of land which are now cut off and isolated from their primary parent piece of land. A great example of this is a place called the Kentucky Bend. It falls right on the Mississippi River and it's the very western tip of Kentucky. If you look at a map, you'll see that Kentucky ends and then past where it ends, there's a tiny little pimple of land that juts up that's formed because of the shape of the river, which is also part of Kentucky, but completely cut off from the rest of Kentucky. And the only way to visit this piece of land is to leave Kentucky into a different state and then go back into the bend as a separate destination. Now what's really cool is these little examples of isolated land that's pinched off or separated from its primary piece of land. They exist all over the world and they're called exclaves. Now if you go back to that episode where I talked about my trip to Nunavut, in a sense, Tiny Island was kind of an exclave too, because the only way I could visit it was if I passed through Quebec first. Now that's a little bit of a unique situation because it's an island, and so by definition it's cut off from all other land, but it's just another example of how certain geographical oddities fit within different parts of a Venn diagram, so to speak. Now going back to the broad topic of borders themselves, it's gotta be said that there is an enormous fascination with them right? Think about how many people you might know, or even yourself, you're drawn to borders. One of the most famous places that you can visit here in Arizona is Four Corners. This is a place where four states meet, and you can stand on a single point and be in four states at once. Why else would that be attractive to anybody other than the fact that it's just goofy? It's a border. We're all drawn to them. There's something just really fascinating about lines on a map being able to stand on either side of a border. Think back when I talked about my trip to the Arctic Circle and there was just something about standing there with my left leg south of the Arctic Circle and my right leg north of the Arctic Circle. I don't know why that is such a pull, but I have to admit it is a deep fascination within me. Any place where I can go where I can be on a border or near a border or in some unique type of border situation, I'm gonna find a way to get there. If you ask me why, I don't know if I'd be able to explain it other than just, I like discrete things. I like, it's very mathematical. Here's a line on the road that separates one thing from another. It's very real, it's very tangible. As I'm saying this, I'm standing here literally on a road in the woods it's just, I don't know what it is about it, but borders 
are fascinating. We all love them, we're all drawn to them. Now, a few years ago when I was living in Vermont, you could visit the town of Brattleboro and actually go to a small bar for a drink. And what made this bar unique was that it was built right across the border with New Hampshire. And so a small portion of the bar actually sat in New Hampshire and there was a line drawn on the ground. And no matter when I would go to this bar, you'd always see someone, you know, happily standing across that line while they were drinking their beer. It's just something goofy about being able to be in two places at once. That's just one of those things that we can all sort of get silly about. Now, if you go online and you start looking at border anomalies or places where borders are disputed. There's an entire Wikipedia page dedicated to such places. Now there's the obvious places that we all know about, places like Palestine and Israel where some borders are disputed, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, places like that. But there's also a lot of places that aren't as well known. For example, there's a small portion of land in southern Egypt that due to some weird border anomaly and border dispute, is actually not claimed by anyone. So Egypt doesn't claim it, Sudan doesn't claim it, Ethiopia doesn't claim it, it's not claimed by anyone. So that's actually the one place on the entire planet, except for Antarctica, that's not claimed by any country. And incidentally, a rich businessman from Europe actually went there and planted his flag and tried to declare it his own nation. Of course, it's not universally recognized by anyone, but it's still goofy, right? That's totally something that I could see myself doing just for the sheer goofiness of it. I'm going to stand on this piece of land, plant my proverbial flag, and declare it the home of on two feet. It's silly, but I bet a lot of you are thinking the same thing. And there's another great example of this. There's a small place in Europe on the Danube River, where due to one of these meander bends, a small piece of land got cut off from Croatia. Now, just like with this example from Egypt, a Czech politician went to this small parcel of land, planted his flag, and declared it the independent principality and micronation of Lieberland, using this weird and obscure doctrine known as terris nullius, which is basically no one's land, therefore I can declare it mine. Now, obviously no one recognizes this nationally, just like with the Egypt claim, but it's still a goofy thing. And the guy even went so far as to set up his own currency and stamps and all sorts of goofy stuff. Now I'll give you another really funny example. Off the coast of UK, there's this military platform that was used as sort of a lookout fort during World War II. And after the war, it just kind of sat there and went defunct. Well, this one guy from the UK decided to go out, this guy named Roy Bates, he went out there with his family and declared this weird man-made fort the Principality of Sealand. And he's been there ever since, and he's turned it into an entire business. He has passports, he has currency, he has stamps. Heck, you can even petition to become your own lord or lady of Sealand just for the heck of it. Now, this is one of those things where like the UK could probably go in it at any point and kick them out, but it's honestly not worth their time. So for the time being, there's this goofy family that's sitting out on a random platform in the middle of the ocean who has declared themselves their own nation just for the heck of it. The reason I'm telling you all this is just get the point across that borders are not only fascinating and attractive for whatever reason, and there's a pull to them, but that in many cases, they can be anomalous and you can get strange places where no one claims land or more than one country claims land or you get a small bubble of land that's cut off from the rest of its parent country. Now, as I mentioned before, one of these categories of geographical border anomalies that's really fascinating to me is that of geographical exclaves. Now, the term exclave is actually a broad category of any portion of land that's cut off from its parent portion of land. But you'll see if you actually dig into it, there's a lot of different subcategories of exclaves. You've got political exclaves, practical exclaves, penny exclaves, ethnic exclaves. So there's all sorts of different kinds. And the particular exclave that I'm most fascinated with, I would say would be the practical exclaves or actual geographic portions of land that are cut off from other portions of land. 
Now, other than the Kentucky Bend, there's actually quite a few examples of exclaves that exist all around the world. One of the most famous is a place in Europe called the Kaliningrad Oblast. Now, this is a small piece of land that is technically and politically part of Russia, but is completely cut off from mainland Russia. And it sits sort of between Poland and Lithuania or Latvia, I'm not sure which one, but it sits sort of up there on the Baltic Sea, but is completely isolated from the rest of Russia. And it's just one of these goofy places. So in order to visit the Kaliningrad Oblast of Russia from, say, Moscow, you actually have to leave Russia, go through a European country, and then come out the other side into the Kaliningrad Oblast. So it's just this really strange place. Now, obviously, you could visit it by water, by coming out through the Baltic Sea. But if you want to visit it by land, you have to pass through another country. Now, if you look at a map of the United States, particularly the contiguous United States, you might think that like the northern tip of Maine is the farthest point north, but you'd be wrong. Actually, the entire northern part of western United States runs along the 49th parallel, which is the highest point, the farthest point north in the contiguous 48. With one exception, if you look at the northern part of Minnesota, you'll see that there's a small portion of land that actually sits above the 49th parallel and is completely isolated from the rest of the United States. Now, this piece of land is called the Northwest Angle or Angle Inlet. And as I said, the only way you can visit it by land is to go through Canada. Now, speaking of the northern border of the United States, if you zoom in to the Seattle area of Washington and then you make your way up to the Canadian border, what you'll find is there's a tiny portion of land that just barely juts below the 49th parallel and so is therefore part of the United States. However, it's completely isolated from the rest of Washington. So the only way to get to this piece of land is to go up and around through Canada. This piece of land is called Point Roberts and it's incredibly small and only one tiny community is set up on this piece of land. Now with all this said, I could give you countless examples of such places and I challenge you open a map start looking around and very quickly you will start to find places that exist that fall into this category places of land that politically belong to one state region or nation but yet are completely cut off and isolated from that state or nation with all this said and now that you have some idea of what geographical exclaves are I'm going to take you back to the fall of 2014 to my trek to nowhere to a small practical exclave of Vermont known as Province Point. In November of 2014, I spent a few weeks gallivanting around Montreal, Canada, and it was on my way back that I got the idea to visit a very special place called Province Point. Now, when it came time to leave Montreal and head back to the States, my plan was to re-enter somewhere along the Vermont border. And when I realized this, a memory popped into my head. I recalled several months earlier, sort of just scanning along the US-Canadian border because that's what a geographile does with their spare time. I remember stumbling across a very unique geographical oddity up along the Vermont-Canadian border. Now, if you zoom in to the Vermont-Canadian border, particularly near Lake Champlain, you'll find a place called Alberg. And there's a very well-known exclave there known as the Alberg Tongue. This is a small piece of land that juts down from Canada that you can only get to by crossing bridges. Now this is technically an exclave, although not particularly sexy in any sort of way, since you can get to it by driving over bridges. However, if you zoom in on this exclave as close as you can get, what you'll notice is just to the east of the primary piece of land that marks the Alberg Tongue, you'll see the smallest portion of land that just barely juts down across the US-Canadian border. I'm talking about a piece of land that's only two acres in size or one hectare. And if you zoom in as far as Google Maps will let you, you'll actually see that this piece of land is titled Province Point. Now, if you zoom in close enough, you will see that this small piece of land does sit at the end of a dirt road that's lined with some houses, but it's not entirely clear if this piece of land is publicly accessible or not. And so 
you might be scratching your head thinking, can I actually get there? Is it worth a drive if it's on private property? But since I was driving home that way anyway, I decided I was gonna go for it and see how far I could get. So, extremely early in the morning on a foggy November day, as I was driving down from Montreal, Canada, I drove down a very small dirt road lined with what appeared to be summer homes all boarded up for the winter. I parked at a small parking area near a campground about a half mile from the end of the point, walked down the dirt road, examined all the houses. They all appeared to be shuttered up for the winter, got to the end of the road, didn't see any obvious no trespassing or private property signs. Of course, everything was in French. And so I just kept walking. I walked to the end of the dirt road. It carried on, it became a dual track Jeep road. I carried on even further, walked across sort of a swampy area. And only moments later, I arrived at a small concrete block with a white metal obelisk marking the US Canadian border. The same type of obelisk that I encountered at the end of my Pacific Crest Trail through hike over in Washington. And that was really it. I walked around on this piece of land for about 15 minutes. I was getting battered by an extremely cold wind off of the lake. My fingers were frozen. I was shivering. For all intents and purposes, I should have been miserable. But yet I sat on that block that marked the border and I had the biggest smile on my face. I was giggling, standing partially in the United States, partially in Canada. It's the most obscure place that you can possibly imagine to cross into the United States and literally see the only two acres of that land in front of you. It was so incredibly small, a couple dozen trees at most, nothing but dead grass, and that was really it. I wandered around for about 10 more minutes, took a bunch of silly pictures, and then just as quickly as I walked out there, I scampered back to my car, none the wiser, nobody saw me, I never ran into a single person, got into my car, drove away, a few minutes later I entered Vermont, and I was back home within a few hours. But to this day, it was one of the most interesting and obscure places that I've ever visited. Not only is Province Point a true practical exclave, an international practical exclave, but it's such a tiny and goofy, weird little place that I just couldn't help myself to go and visit it. So that was my trip to Province Point, Vermont. Highly recommended. However, if you're watching this video, and it's exciting you, and it's getting you amped up to go and visit this place yourself, I do wanna add a small disclaimer, just for the record. I went there on a very cold day in November, and I didn't see a single soul. Didn't see any signage, didn't see any warning signs, but that doesn't mean that this wasn't private property. So I was very careful. I obviously left nothing, only footprints, took some pictures, that was it, leave no trace, did all the right things. But I had no way of really knowing whether or not I was actually on public or private land. So word of caution is if you are thinking about doing this trip, please be respectful of the land. And I would recommend at least knowing some conversational French in case you do run into somebody and have to explain yourself. Now I've taken enough French and lived in Montreal enough that I could get by uh, apologizing profusely and explaining, I just, just wanted to visit this small piece of goofy land. I'm sure that whoever lives in that last house probably gets more than a few visitors because of the very nature of where they live. So I'm sure I wouldn't be the first person that they encountered trying to visit Province Point. But that's my caveat, that's my disclaimer. If you are thinking about visiting this piece of land, be respectful and be ready to possibly speak some French just in case you run into somebody who is maybe uh, less than enthused that you might be there. So with that, I'm gonna end this episode of Treks to Nowhere, where we talked about some more geographical goofy oddities, specifically exclaves and border anomalies, and I got to go back and revisit my trip in November of 2014 to Province Point, Vermont. Thanks everyone, take care, and be safe.